Jack Snowberger. I am a junior at Aurora High School. I interviewed Harlan Schaefer about his military service. Throughout this video, you will learn about his experience serving in the U.S. Navy. You will notice some interactive pop-up features that will provide more information when you click on them. Piece of material, and it can be used for a bandage. It can be used for making a sling. It's got a lot of different, uh, you know, like a broken arm sling. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's got a lot of function that way. Um, the uh, the flap on the back of the Cracker Jacks, you think, well, that's, that's kind of silly. Yeah. But if you ever turn your back to a biting north wind in November, oh. this thing flips up and comes around your ears, and it feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I came to appreciate some yeah. of those, those quirky little things. Mm -hmm. And sailors always have their rating on their sleeve. The the globe uh, in the Navy they call a light bulb a globe. When they ordered the patches for electricians' mates a bazillion years ago, mm -hmm. they told them to put a globe on it. Well, they meant a light bulb, but they put a globe on it. <laughs> well, that's just stuck. Mm -hmm. um, for an interior communications electrician, uh, they put a telephone over the top of it. Uh, I was an I seaman. Um, at the time, they had they allowed two electrical ratings to be nu nuclear power qualified, the electricians' mates and the, and the interior communications electricians, and uh, so that was being phased out as I was uh, about to get out of the navy. So now, it's electricians' mates or the electricians in the navy or in the nuclear power field. Um, so had I been an electrician's mate, it would have just had the the globe. The globe. Yeah. Hmm. So we were we were jumping off of these Fairwater planes. You can see the water lines about yeah. here. It's about thirty feet, and uh, they had guys on these Fairwater planes with rifles in case the sharks came around. But oh yeah. You, the the water was so clear; it was just beautiful, oh, really? so you could see forever. But jumping off of this, when I jumped off. Of course, you kind of go underwater, and I turned around and I saw the whole underside of that submarine. I just let me back in, <laughs> but it was pretty impressive to oh, see yeah. it. Um, this, of course, shows it out of the water, but it's pretty impressive to see it mm -hmm. uh, in the water. We had, uh, on my third patrol, we had just gone patrol, out on patrol, we had just gone to sea, and uh, after only about a week, we were ordered back to Holy Lock, which we thought mm -hmm. was, was very unusual. Uh, we came back at night, uh, tied up next to the tender, and uh, the next day, uh, we were up on the tender, myself and a few of my shipmates, and the captain of the tender came on board on the all stations and said, uh, attention all hands, the, the ship on the port side does not exist. It's not there. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. It's not there. We kind of went port side, port side, port side. That's us. <laughs> and uh, it was all because the mission that we'd been assigned was under a, a cloud of secrecy. They took off four of our uh, nuclear missiles and they loaded in four dummy missiles uh, that did not have warheads. And uh, about the next day, we left again under the cover of darkness and went to sea. It took us about two weeks to get on station. Uh, I didn't know at the time I knew uh, within about 50 miles of one of Russia's busiest naval bases. And um, we launched our missiles. Uh, a very interesting sequence leading up to that the, uh, they broadcast buys commercial aircraft to stay out of a flight path. And then right before the launch, it's my understanding that okay. our president okay. calls their president and says, hey, we're going to launch missiles for a test. They're all going south. Don't worry about it. But uh, we launched those missiles. And, and being on the boat at that time, of course, I was running the numbers. I was thinking, let's see, this boat's 20 years old. And we're going to blow 64,000 pounds of missile out of the middle of it. And then 64,000 pounds of water is going to run back into the empty hole. 
and we're going to do this while we're underwater and the boat was built by the lowest bidder and can this possibly be a good idea <laughs> um, during that evolution my battle stations for battle station missile and battle stations torpedo was up in the control room right beside the captain so it was very interesting to observe that uh, sequence but when when the missiles launched the boat kind of flexes in the middle the bottom goes down or the middle goes down the ends go up and it, it felt like standing on a diving board that, that springiness and we launched four missiles like that the guys in the torpedo room and the engine room said it was a wild ride there mm -hmm. um, because of the the flexing but um, when you launch missiles there are toxic gases that get vented inboard um, because you're underwater mm -hmm. and so the the crew in the missile compartment is all in gas masks and and uh, we have to go uh, close enough to the surface to put a mast up to ventilate those gases uh, so after the launch we uh, started going back up um, they call that it's basically periscope depth where we can stick a snorkel mast up but they first raise a uh, electronic surveillance mast they call it an ESM mast that checks for any radars in the area to see if anybody's up there and um, the radar guys told us that as soon as we raised that mast a Russian radar took one sweep and locked onto our mast so we pulled it back down and went back down and the guys in the missile compartment stay in their gas masks mm -hmm. um, I don't know how long it was 30 minutes or an hour we went back up and the captain raised the periscope and he said he watched a Soviet Bear D uh, anti-submarine airplane fly right over the top of us I thought, golly, how'd they get on top of us so fast? So we went back down. And uh, we went up an hour later, and there was two, two airplanes up there now. He says, ah, let's just get ventilated. And so we got ventilated. Well, later that night, um, there was a, uh, a Kiev-class destroyer joined the, the group. Uh, we had a couple more destroyers and a couple submarines join the group, uh, Russian submarines, and they just dogged us. They dogged us for three days. And we were at battle stations that whole time. And because of the need to rotate people through and the need to maintain ultra-quiet, um, crew members that aren't on watch basically go to bed to minimize moving around and they they rotate people through the uh, battle stations watch stations to the extent they can well after about three days one of our fast attack submarines came in and they call this procedure delousing they they came in with fast speed pumps fast speed everything they were putting so much noise in the water nobody else could hear anything we just went quiet went deep snuck away well a fast boat really can get away pretty easily but a boomer a, a SSBN a ballistic missile submarine it's like a barn in the water <laughs> and so um, so they deloused us and uh, um, we went back to Holy Lock uh, we got our other missiles back on them went back out on patrol but while we were there when we pulled into Holy Lock, there was a fast attack submarine in Holy Lock, and there was never a fast attack submarine in Holy Lock. And, and so I met one of their electricians up on the tender, and I said, hey, what are you guys doing here? He says, ah, oh, he says, we were on Liberty, and we had to come de some boomer. I know, oh, I wonder who that was. <laughs> he wasn't happy about it at all. <laughs> when you go up and down like you did, like, do you, do you go up and down like three times or something like that? Is that right? From, like, the, from trying to ventilate? Would you go up and down three times? Yeah. Does that like mess with your head or mess with your stomach or? No, and it's really a very gradual thing. Most of the time, oh, uh, the floor is always a little bit crooked on a submarine. There's always a little bit of an up bubble or down bubble. It's always, but most of the time you don't feel the uh, raising and lowering because it, the boat goes up so gradually, and it does come up to a very level plane. 
um, the boat can do um, very steep dives, very, very uh, steep inclines. And um, those are times where you're really, I mean, you're really standing on the floor mm -hmm. and it's, it's crooked. You know, it's like a 15 degree mm -hmm. um, and they can go steeper than that. But uh, so most of the time you don't notice the, the deep dives and, because it's pretty gradual do notice it's kind of interesting you kind of hear the because the hole does contract as you go deep oh, yeah. and so you, so you kind of hear that and, and submariners become very attuned to every little noise and every pump and every uh, they just become very accustomed to what the ship normally does because things that it does unusual puts them on alert very quickly mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I mentioned that one time uh, we were going to our test depth, which was uh, well in excess of 400 feet. But uh, they stretched a string. Uh, some of the guys in the cruise mess stretched a string from one side of the hull to the other where the compartment allowed you to go that far. But that string was sagging about three feet all the way to the ground by the time we got to test, test depth because the hull had contracted that much. And uh, it, it's very interesting how much those that metal was made to flex with the mm -hmm. with the pressure of the ocean. 